Thank you so much, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, so we continue with the weird life, and uh, our last speaker who will summarize kind of ideas, I would say, we discussed today and present his own ideas is Professor Lee Cronin. He is professor at the Glasgow University, and uh, he he's a chemist, and he works on creating artificial life forms in the in the lab, and um, he works on digitizing uh, digitizing of chemistry and constructing chemical computers. So the question which is guiding his research is: What is the minimal chemical system that can undergo evolution? And does, uh, does that system uh, necessarily use the current chemical infrastructure uh, used by biology or not? So beyond biology. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's late my time, and which means I might speak slowly, which is probably good. Um, so what I'm going to try and talk about is the ideas we've got in the lab to try and look at life a little bit differently. I'm an inorganic chemist, so I don't know any organic chemistry unlike uh, Dr. Benner, who was presenting some eloquent ideas earlier. So what I'm going to try and do is explain a completely different perspective of how you might start again and look for chemistry in the universe that might come alive. And I'm kind of inspired by this nanomachine here, which you can find on the web. It doesn't exist. It's a, a Drexlerian machine where you take all these inorganic cogs and put them together. And it reminds me a bit of a wristwatch that you might want to build. But as we've been told, the watchmaker was blind. So when you're thinking about the amount of information required to build that wristwatch, the same problem is associated with nanomolecules and assemblies of nanomolecules. You simply can't get the complexity for free. In this animation here, this is actually uh, showing real molecules that we make in my lab just by adding basically lemon juice to molybdate, which is a really expensive version of rust, if you like. And this rust forms nanomolecules, which basically can self-replicate. And the idea here been depicting is that they can actually form cells as well. And they don't quite go and take over the universe, but it does happen at the nanoscale. And the idea is to see if we can look at life or the intrinsic properties that life um, uh, takes from chemistry to exist at all. So we really need to start again. So why has no one made real life? from scratch, all the people that have made life in the lab have cheated. They have taken existing building blocks, and those building blocks were produced by evolution. And those, that evolutionary process goes back to one genesis point. So I'm proposing that we kind of throw that away and think a little bit more inorganically. It gives us many more places to go and look. But why, firstly, has no one made inorganic life in the lab? Is it not possible? Do we not have enough time, money, or stuff? Are there problems selecting the building blocks? I think the, it's really nice that I've been able, although I've come in late, that's why I'm last, it's really nice to give the talk last because it brings together a lot of the ideas that have been put forward today, particularly the digital life. Because it shows digital life, when it's going, is really sloppy and messy. I'm trying to convince chemists that the life we have now, the biology is really, really using compressed, elegant, organic chemistry. But life started really messy. So how, what can digital life teach us about making life again? And how do we engineer this thing? Are we going to build a, uh, a large hadron collider for the origin of life? I think that's an interesting question. Chemists tend to work in their own labs and argue with each other. Physicists argue with each other. But when they're given a pot of huge amount of money to go look at the universe, they tend to find a way to collaborate. So that's one of my kind of pet projects, is trying to get chemists to collaborate. So what is our new approach, approach to evolution? And, and is evolution the dynamic we need? It, I don't really want to argue about that. You can replace that to information. Because one thing I want to convince you about, we all talk about information. But if there is no observer, there is no information. So this whole idea about information in a universe where there is no life is actually null and void. Now, I'm not going to start you know, smoking uh, uh, cannabis and getting philosophical. I just want to think about how does a chemist that doesn't know anything about life build a life form is really a similar problem to how does life get going in the first place. So I'd argue that my ignorance gives me a perfect opportunity to start again. So what is our new approach going to be? 
Well, we want to explore a theory for biology and evolution. How do we do that? Well, we need to build a model. It's a bit like what physicists do. We need to make a machine to emerge that biology. And then we need to know when we've made it. The problem is we all argue about what life could have been at the beginning, what the origin was. But we don't have, even have any metric now to measure. You know, some undergraduates don't look alive when I'm lecturing to them. So how do I know how, what the difference between life and death is? And, I, and a couple of years ago, um, uh, uh, Sarah Walker and I wrote a small commentary on this in science. And they made this really nice picture, which kind of articulated this idea that you can have non-living networks, fire, radical reactions, and reactions that are constrained in some way. And those constraining those networks appears to give something similar to you know, what you find in living systems. So the idea is make a new theory, build a machine, make a model of that theory, build a machine, and then measure it. So suddenly we bring the origin of life not just as a historical uh, perspective, but we start to think about how we can build a machine to look for life in our laboratories and perhaps even more importantly, set the limits for life elsewhere and stop worrying about whether there are many Earths and if just the chemistry of Earth is what is needed. So we're going to play a game um, that's going to keep me awake. I want you to tell me each object that comes up is from evolution or not, not alive or not. No, it's a bit of sand. <laughs> from evolution or not? Yeah, oh, we're getting there. N not really. It hasn't got enough features, but it is a, a bio hint. So yes, you know that it was made by a person or a machine. But if you found that on Mars, you'd argue. Whereas if you found that on Mars, you'd be like, well, OK, who's the creator? Carry on. Yeah, OK, we're getting there. So <laughs> now up there, this molecule, I want to argue that molecules are really great uh, um, uh, when they're complex enough evidence of evolution they were produced for using an evolutionary process. And so the thesis is that complex molecules aren't spontaneous, and that is molecules that you can find in any abundance. So this is a, a molecule which is kind of large, made by biology called Taxol, which is a relatively good uh, anti-cancer drug. And the idea we've been playing in my lab anyway is to try and make drugs using robots and try and understand the digital information. How big does my program need to be to make the molecule? And that's how we got thinking in this way. Or well, actually, it's the other way around. I needed money to build robots to search for the origin of life. And no one would give me any money for that. It's like, ah, oh, no, 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 I'm going to make drugs for you instead. Then you can get money. And through this process, we realized the process of digitization of chemical control could allow us to think about information and chemistry differently, and then start to think about an alien index. And let's say that complex molecules are technosignatures. And again, from the last talk, I think it really fits rather well. If we can expand our idea of what a technosignature for life would look like, it doesn't have to be um, a fantastically advanced AI that's going to kill us all, or a new type of propulsion system. It could be as simple as a molecule, or as complex as a molecule. So to do this, we, developed, we had to develop in my lab a, a new way of thinking about how we could assign whether a molecule you find in the environment was a random, just simple or more complicated. And this needs us to actually develop a kind of new information measure. Now, there's lots of, if you go and talk to a complexity theorist about information, they'll tell you they've done it all before and what you're talking about is silly. So I'm going to show you some equations that don't mean anything really, so I will skip them and just go to here. Because the only point I want to say is it doesn't matter whether pathway assembly is a new measurement of assembly. It's the concept of how can you probabilistically understand if your molecule was made randomly or by someone that had some information or something. So that's kind of the point. So really thinking about how you then break that molecule up into parts, because molecules are made of atoms connected by bonds. And you aren't just going to suddenly magically make a protein in a soup of elements, are you? So this is the idea. You can break it down and come up with the word banana. And it actually does, is, it's a very similar to Komogolorov complexity, those of you who like that thing, but it has history. And the difference between biology, the chemistry of biology and the chemistry of my lab is that most of biological chemistry has a history. That's the thing that we're trying to do, is put history into chemistry to turn it into biology. 
So the information content of chemical space, let's search it. So we use the algorithm we wrote to basically take these molecules and calculate their pathway assembly number. Now, when I was doing this, I was talking to various uh, colleagues and they're saying, well, you have C60, is gonna, you can find it in space. So you've really got to have that at your threshold. And so we went through and evaluated chemical space. And it's really interesting that lots of these molecules, lots of molecules you would say were complex actually fought below the threshold. But that outlier up there, I don't think the laser pointer works here, is actually Viagra which I think is really interesting. So Viagra, obviously, is a, uh, uh, I was trying to convince a colleague at a NASA meeting. He said, well, if I went to Mars and I found Viagra in my mass spectrometer, I know something was up, which he then obviously thought was. <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't, he, gen he genuinely didn't think at the time, but it got him thinking because Viagra is not made by biology. It has, a, a, obviously, a comical or maybe essential effect. It was made by human beings who are made by biology. So it's kind of interesting. So how are we going to make life in the lab from scratch? So I'm now going to spend the last few minutes just quickly um, scooting through what we're doing in the lab. So we're trying to go cell first by basically just mixing together salad dressing and to try and make large oil-based droplets and see how they can start to differentiate. And again, it's, you can view this like a hybrid computation. There was a question made from Morgan earlier to, uh, to, to Charles about can you take go 2D and 3D, and I'd say, no, don't waste your computing time doing that. Make a hybrid computation. What does that look like? Robot here mixes salad dressing in a pot, and we get these cells here, which are oil droplets, that show all sorts of really complex behaviors for free because they exploit the laws of physics. And so can we then harness the laws of physics, which are information-free, to suddenly start to symmetry break. These ones even explode when they get bored. So they, same chemicals, different proportions. The things just show extraordinary behaviors. But we need to get a memory. So what do we do next to get this memory? So we started to think about building a machine that would basically do some chemistry, make a mess, and then almost clean it out, but leave some residual from before and keep on making a mess like a graduate student that couldn't be bothered to really clean it out. So you leave some history in there. And this is the first version of the machine we've got there. And on the left-hand side is all the clean stuff. You can see where the graduate student's been, so it's getting messy, and then some of the output's there. And what happens is, over time, you get more and more of a mess. Do you get just a combinatorial explosion and get nothing interesting, or do you start to get something coming out that's more complex? And so we're having to ex explore these soups using mass spectrometry, and by adding, basically, salt in there, we're finding the salt is the environment, like we need in Avida, you need salt in your digital world, um, and suddenly you start to get massive jumps in complexity or the molecules that you can make. And why is that? Well, the, the minerals we throw in there, even the identity of the mineral gives you a different transition in your soup, which is pretty mind-blowing. But I just want to show you this here. This is the, some of the samples. Using, so using our complexity measure, using the machine together, we were able to show that over a few weeks, suddenly what happens is you get a transition in the, in the, in the, in the uh, assembly number of the molecules that comes out. And this is very much work in progress. So the idea is that there is some kind of biology threshold, that we have these trivial molecules. We get to the bio hints. Remember, the brick is almost alive, but not quite alive, to the fact that if you find ATP synthase or protein that's big enough, you're going to say, hang on. We've also showed this for mass spectrometry, that we can validate this for molecules, also using infrared spectroscopy remotely. So the idea to go and see molecules that are complex in uh, other uh, places in the solar system might be possible. And we can even do this for images. And we can find if people have been plagiarizing artwork, which is one application of pathway assembly. So what are the conclusions and take-home messages? Uh, making life with organic chemistry in the lab is now being attempted. A new, new life with new chemistry will help us look beyond Earth. Why do we have to be constrained to water? Venus has probably got some interesting dynamics, but the pressure and the temperature are different, and we simply don't know what the chemistry looks like because we have no chemists on Venus. And we found that complex molecules are good techno signatures, not just in the laboratory, but remotely. So I'd love to develop this in my lab and then also then take that out and go and look a bit more remotely, maybe even uh, uh, think about how that might work with um, astronomical data, breakthrough listen, and so on. And this is the idea. You know, 
How much do you have to erode your rock before it no longer is a statue and your DNA before it's no longer DNA and fresh hold it? And that's what we're trying to do. I'll stop there and I've got one minute for questions. This is the team that did it in Glasgow. Thanks very much. Okay, okay. Thanks for this really interesting and educational talk. Um, one thing that we've known about from astronomy for a while is uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which are very complex molecules that form in the cold of space. Can you talk about those? Yeah, well, I, that and Murchison is the most, one of the most common questions I get. I think what would be really interesting is to explore um, a bit more um, rigorously what we can do in the lab with these polyaromatic hydrocarbons. We make them, we are really good at making a mess in our lab now. <laughs> and we're trying to say, well, uh, how much of, if you put no information in, if we, do, if we don't cheat, what does spectroscopic signatures look like for the PAHs we make in our lab compared to what you observe? That's interesting, they're similar. Then when we start to cheat and put in information, because we're chemists and we know how to make stuff, and when you let a chemist in the lab who knows how to make something, they can't but jimmy rig it so the temperature's right, the pressure's right to make what they want. And I, then you start to get differences in the outcomes. Now, how can we look for that remotely would be really interesting. So that's my comment at the moment. I think using that background and benchmarking that properly would be really good. Does that make sense? <laughs>